the actual lecture. It's it's a little bit more of the background, and and um, I was uh, 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 Randy and I had a really good relationship. I was uh, around when he was trying to. Uh, get this woman to marry him, you know, and uh, <laughs> which he talks a lot more about in this in his book. But uh, neat guy, and uh, really liked the, his attitude about uh, uh, not only uh, computer science, but about life. And of course, the uh, the lecture wasn't about computer science. It was really about uh, um, you know if you had only a few months to live, what would you say? And as he points out in the lecture, the whole idea of the lecture was not for the people that are in the audience. It was for his kids. And they had, he wanted to put some kind of a stake in the ground that his kids could always come back to, you know, of what, because, uh, you know, they're young and they may not remember him uh, in terms of their direct relationship with him. But anyhow, it's a sad deal. and. And you'd hope that uh, we could do better in terms of our technology, but uh, we don't know that much. We only know the tip of the iceberg. And um, so you guys, as you're going into the future, have to solve these problems, right? That's your, your challenge. Okay, well, let's uh, review a little bit as we want to do, and the, the uh, as we start off these things, you guys know the de you know all the definitions, right? You've seen this now. This is the fourth time you've seen these. You know the four things about the important things about building an interface. We've looked at the models, all the bits and pieces that you have to take into account, uh, both on the human side and the machine side. We're going to talk a little bit more about the task side today. Uh, although, be it a little bit, uh, there'll be some other things that, you know, that sort of bounce around with the human and the tool as well. But the, the task is the reason that we're building the tools, is to help the human perform those tasks. We learned a lot about, uh, uh, about how we organize not only do we have our senses, how do we organize? What's a perceptual organization? And the fact that we're three-dimensional and we have this uh, amazing visual system and two brains and all that kind of stuff. And then when we take all that into account and compare it with what we have today, why don't you shut the door, um, James? Uh, there are some real problems. We find that, uh, you know, we're not sure how these things tend to evolve this way, although this is like a typewriter. It's just like the horseless carriage, you know, look like a, a horse's carriage. <laughs> we sort of tend, things tend to evolve that way when in fact this is not a very good way of building an interface to a simple processor that'll do a billion operations a second. And for these, these are some of the reasons why this isn't a very good interface and uh, because in the end there really is low bandwidth to the brain of what we could be doing. So the interface then becomes this bottleneck. So we talked about uh, the systems engineering, the design cycle that you generally go through when you're designing interfaces. Looked at the commandments. Looked at this idea of using a persona to represent the user uh, because it's generally it's very difficult to uh, to um, make everybody happy. So you concentrate on one person. The, and, uh, the story about the Porsche uh, car, you know, what uh, the guy, the Porsche who actually designed the Porsche said, I designed that car for myself. And I didn't really care about anybody else. I just wanted something that I would like. And generally when you do that, uh, you find out that other people will like it as well. And as we approach the whole technology side, we said, okay, uh, we're, let's come up with this way of talking about this taxonomy with the mediation. We looked at different forms of, the, of this um, uh, taxonomy related to things like augmented vision. <clears throat> 
and uh, of course examples of augmented vision that you guys are well aware of. And then this whole idea of virtual images and uh, some things that you can do with virtual images. And especially some examples I gave you in, uh, in fighter airplanes and building uh, helmet sighting and helmet display systems. And then combining those two into something like this that uh, let us close the loop with various subsystems on the aircraft. And not only by head slaving of um, uh, moving of, uh, of the sensors and things around like that uh, with the head position, but we can also do it with eye position. Talked about uh, the um, personal eyewear display, how I, when I moved into from the military to the academic side, the whole idea was building this, uh, uh, this capability that would, could be used for other applications other than the military ones. I was going to bring the MyView headset in, but I'll have to bring it in uh, next time so you guys can you guys can play with it. And then, of course, the MyView, Oculus Rift, all these things that are coming are not even close to what you can do with a virtual retinal display, where you're scanning one pixel, really high speed, with high luminance, high saturation, all of that. Um, but we're seeing the reemergence of these kinds of display technology, even though the the virtual retinal display is now, gosh, it's almost, it's almost 20 years old, 15 years old. Um, um, but then we have the eyeglasses, which are, of course, uh, um, taking back in the other direction of just a small field of view, but having other functionality in there. So that's sort of where we've been, uh, a summary of where we've been. Any questions you guys have so far with this? How expensive are the retinal displays? I'll say the, yeah, the. Well, the, most of the ones that uh, exist today are for military applications. And they're, you know, several thousand dollars. Um, but there's nothing inherently in there that, you, that costs a lot. Okay. One, the, the MEM scanner device itself is, is, uh, I mean, it's economy of scale kind of thing. We make them in a, um, in a silicon fa factory we actually have at the University of Washington. We make the MEMS machines there. And um, so they're, they're done in a limited production. But if you were in full production, you know, this, you could really, the, the, the actual hardware cost would be in the order of, uh, you know, $10. Um, um, and uh, you could build these things, you know, that, for, uh, and sell them for about, usually your markup is about five times that, four or five times that, so 50 bucks. You can have an amazing uh, virtual retinal display um, that just blows everything else out of the water. No. It, it's, it, sorry? Brother. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I'm not sure, but it's a... No, it's not, it's not a virtual retinal display okay. that I know of. Yeah. Okay. I, I think mm -hmm. You're showing it to the other guys. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so... Uh, a few more uh, war stories about uh, where all of this fighter cockpit stuff led. So, uh, as I mentioned to you before, my job was to figure out how to solve the problems in the in a modern fighter cockpit, where you had all these instruments and uh, and uh, controls, and displays and controls. One of the problems that we uh, were dealing with is with all the sensors on board the aircraft. Uh, they would find things out in the world, but how was that communicated spatially to the pilot? And uh, one of the problems, of course, is with the, uh, when you have these smaller displays, um, it wasn't very easy to match where things would show up on the display here with what, where they were out in the world. There was this disconnect, there was a scale factor kind of thing. And even the head-up display had a limited field of view in terms of what you're able to see out in the world. So if, you, if you're finding things over here, especially with some of our, our uh, radar warming, warning systems, 
So let's say that you were being radiated by somebody. They had a radar turned on or something is scanning you. And you want to know that. And you want to know uh, not only the signature of who's scanning you, but where they are. Well, just putting that on a plan view display, on a two-dimensional display, doesn't necessarily communicate that to you. Right. It's been an hour going off to the edge saying it's over there somewhere. That's right. That's right. Well, that's... Uh, but then again, in order to go over there, you have to either uh, move the whole airplane to look at it or whatever. And now with a head-mounted display, indeed, one of the things that we used was a, um, a visual cue. I mean, even with that helmet-mounted uh, sighting system, with that, just that simple reticle, we had four lights around it. And uh, let's say that your radar had picked up something off axis and uh, then we just turn on was like the like the arrow pointing, look in that direction. The little light would point in that direction, and as your head was coincident with that line of sight, then all four lights would come on and say okay. But this required a, a volitional turning of the head in order to track this thing to know where it was. What if you want to know where it was while you're really busy doing other things, especially rear warning and things like that? So this is took us into the whole domain of acoustic displays. The nice thing about sound is you don't have to have to look at it. And you can head can be in any orientation, you can still get sound. So we uh, came up with this idea of how could we represent three-dimensional information in sound. Now our ears do that already. I mean we have this amazing ability to localize sound. But how do you do that synthetically is a little more difficult. So we had to investigate how do the ears actually process sound information to give directionality. And of course, as, you, as you're listening to a sound coming from a one, one location, um, there are a number of cues that you have. This interaural cue is one of them because you have now a sound coming in uh, that is going to be different depending on which ear picks it up. So you compare those two signals. You compare from a volume standpoint, from a time of arrival standpoint, and you can determine generally in the horizontal plane where things are coming from just by this interaural stimulus that's coming. Okay, so that's all well and good. And then of course, when you move your head, that all changes. That helps you localize things as well. But how do things work? In the sagittal plane, how do you get, how would you think uh, the ears hear in uh, uh, the sound direction, the sagittal plane? So you have to do actually with the, the dimensions and shape of the rest of the ear. That's right. It's the pinnae of the ear. This little meaty part of the ear is really important. And this convolutions that you have there are not for uh, show. They're actually functional. It's an amazing uh, sound processor. When a, when a sound wavefront actually strikes the ear, the outer ear, the, all these convolutions actually act as sound processors. There are all, kind, all kinds of uh, a spectrum analysis that goes on. Uh, there are um, uh, phase delays. There are all kinds of things that go on. So by the time it enters into the ear canal, a lot of processing has taken place. And that means now you can localize sound in the sagittal plane, uh, including going behind you, because you have a different exposure of the ears in the front than you do in behind. So um, one of the things we wanted to do is how could we model that and run that in a, in a way that we processed the sound direction ahead of time, piped it into the ear canal so that you would hear binaural sound. Now, it's sort of uh, the way binaural recordings are made today is you usually take a head, something that looks like a head, uh, and something that looks like ears with the same kind of uh, uh, compliance and things like that, and you put microphones inside this um, artificial head, and then you record the sound, having had this light sound wavefront wash over the head. And then when you play that back in a headset, you know, it sounds like more like you're there. Um, that you have this more like this binaural sound. Well, so uh, how could we do that electronically? 
Well, we started off, and this is the very first work that was being done in uh, electronic three-dimensional sound. What we did was we built this chamber. It was about the size of a coffin. And inside this chamber, we had this um, uh, head. This is actually a graduate student. What we would do is we chop the heads off of graduate students. And then uh, we would mount their head on a DC torque or motor that would rotate this way. And then they were on another DC torque or motor that would rotate this way. And then we put microphones in the ears of that head. And then we have a loudspeaker here that would actually move back and forth on a rail relative to that head that you see there. So the object was that the pilot is sitting in the cockpit moving his head around and, uh, and that head inside the chamber would move with the head moving in the, uh, the, the pilot. And then depending upon where you want the relative direction of a sound to come from, you would position the head in the chamber relative to that. And for the distance, you would move this, this uh, loudspeaker back and forth on this rail. So you'd play, play the sound in the loudspeaker, it would go into the head, you'd take the microphones in the head and you'd play it into the headset of the pilot's helmet in the cockpit. And it worked. Now it turns out that uh, you were listening through somebody else's ears, but it still worked pretty well. And what we uh, rediscovered is this thing known as sacred space. Turns out Helmholtz had even written about it. You guys ever heard of this thing, sacred space? It turns out humans have this volume that surrounds us that is our sacred space. That's our space. That's considered our personal space. And usually for the Western world, it's about arm's length away. You know, um, uh, and what this means is if, um, that when you look at people who are, who are strangers, how close they stand to each other when they're talking, you'll find they're about arm's length away. And that's because any closer than that, they violate your sacred space. And, uh, and it is it's still a cultural thing. I mean, if you're, if you're in Japan, you know, or in China, it may be <laughs> this close. Or if you're in Alaska, it's about 10 miles, you know, is your sacred space. But um, still, this is, a, um, this is something that goes, goes along with humans. Now, um, with this three-dimensional sound, what we could do is electronically bring a person a speaker inside that sacred space uh, because you hear them in 3D. Um, and uh, it turns out that you really cannot, cannot not listen to someone who's in your sacred space. If you have a person now that comes inside your space, um, you know, if it's outside your space, arm's length away, you can be a million miles away while you're interacting with this person. But if they come inside your sacred space, it has your attention by default. So it's like the idea of the old uh, drill sergeant, you know, that, uh, that comes in and is nose to nose to you, uh, shouting at the top of his lungs, you know. Very difficult to ignore what the drill sergeant is saying. Um, so um, we decided this would be a great way to do enunciation of warning systems because the warning systems in the aircraft are really tough to, to handle because you have all that you have this uh, a master panel enunciation panel that tells you what's going on in case there's a master caution that says you've got a hydraulic problem hydraulic pressure or you have a, a, a temperature in your exhaust or your turbine is acting up in your engines or you know whatever your power you have a power problem you have this but if the pilot's in the middle of this heat of the battle, it's really tough to get anybody's attention. The panel goes off and they ignore it. One of the things that we did in other aircraft, especially transport aircraft, there was a, there's always a problem of gear up landings. Ever since the day of retractable landing gears, you know, you take off, retract the landing gears, and you fly. But the whole idea before you land is you extend the landing gear again. Because if you try to land without the landing gear um, extracted, it's really sort of crunchy. 
and uh, makes the general really mad, and you may all have a good day. Good and, day yeah. And so we've tried to come up with all these systems that would warn the pilot that the landing gear is still retracted when they're getting ready to land. I mean, it's all in the checklist and things like that, but that they do the checklist so many times they, they, they have their mind on something else, they jump over these things. So we've tried about everything you can think of. We've had these horns going off in the cockpit. Uh, we've had um, uh, uh, stick shakers that actually shake the control stick. Uh, G-suit pulsers, they would call it the G-suit. You're wearing this G-suit, you know, which is inflates to help you stay conscious when you're pulling G's and things like that. All these things we've tried to get the pilot's attention. We even thought about a rectal probe, you know, and, uh, but uh, the, uh, you, it's amazing. These, these, these pilots that, when you go to the accident board where they uh, uh, investigated why they landed the, the airplane with the gear up, and they said, well, I couldn't tell what was going on because that horn was going off in the cockpit, which was the whole idea. <laughs> You're supposed to listen to the horn in the cockpit. That, that was telling you're going to land the plane without the gear. Well, anyhow. So this now um, gave us an opportunity to move a speaker inside your sacred space. All this other stuff was outside your sacred space. Um, and uh, we started doing some experiments with it. So uh, one of the things, we had these recordings where uh, you could just put on a regular headset in this recording, but and, and, and you've you've heard these. I'm sure you've heard these uh, binaural sound recordings before. It, they're amazing. You can get them off the web. Use them on the headset. Try them out. They're really fun. What you can do with it, especially clipping hair and shaking matches and striking. It's it's amazing. Now it builds the, the your your mental picture around it. Anyhow, uh, there's one demonstration tape we did. We dare somebody to try to drive a car and listen to this at the same time. There's this woman that's, that would speak with this sultry, soft voice. She would speak into right over your shoulder, into your ear. And it was so compelling. You could feel her breath. You could almost feel her breath on your ear, you know. And you're trying to drive the car while you're listening to this. And uh, so it's, uh, it was a, quite a, a powerful demonstration. But so here you are flying along in the airplane, and you have a malfunction in one of your engines. And this voice comes and says, Daddy, you have a fire in your right engine. And it's your daughter's voice. And it is so compelling, again, that you, it's like she's whispering into your ear. It pulls you out of whatever you're doing. So you pay attention to that. Because a fire in a right engine is something you need to pay attention to. So um, this was what we're trying to do, is come up with a better way of communicating these kinds of information. So we built this and we tested it to find out how it would work. Here, for example, was a, a, a tracking system. This is our magnetic tracking system where we're tracking our head position and our hand position. And we would generate this sound, this guy has a headset on, generate a three-dimensional sound and have them point to it. How accurately can you point to a sound that was generated this way? It was amazing. You know, generally, here in front, you're within about uh, uh, one to three degrees in pointing at these things, sounds. Behind you, it's maybe around five degrees. Absolutely amazing that you can do this. Like something, you hear the sound behind you and say, where is it? And you point to it. You can't even see it. And you do that by coupling that sound detection directional detection through all your proprioceptive mechanism, your motor mechanisms that point at it. Well, of course, after this, it's not very practical to fly around this coffin-shaped box in an airplane. And, of course, all of the digital signal processors came along and do the same thing and do it in now in chips, you know, that um, it's no big deal. So that was sort of the, some of the things we're doing in, in three-dimensional sound and discovering a lot about how to do these things. And in particular, what we want to do is generate our own, our own ear print. Each individual has their own ear print. It's the way the pen of your, key, of your ear and your ear canal processes sound information. So what you want to do is basically take an ear print of each individual, and that becomes the model that you use in, the, um, in your digital signal processor. Okay, well, moving on, 
there's this huge complexity problem. We have all these switches, all these displays. And, uh, and the crew member was, is just overwhelmed because all this is in the cockpit. It's highly coded. And here you are, as I mentioned before, flying really fast. The bad guys are shooting at you and things like that. So the question is, how do you connect one operator, one person, to, to uh, 50 computers? Because that's pretty much what you have on board, one of, these, one of these airplanes. Pretty much every one of those computers has some kind of display uh, and some kind of piece of information. So this is what we see then in the normal workstation uh, for a crew member uh, with these 75 displays and seven and, and um, 300 switches and 11 switches on a control stick and nine switches on the throttle. Um, so the question is, as we've talked about before, we know that we can build virtual a virtual display that's larger than any of these displays. So why don't we just sort of take this technology, this sighting technology, the tracking technology, and the display technology, and put them together and basically create a cockpit that you wear. And that's the idea of the super cockpit. This is a cockpit you wear. You put on a magic helmet, a magic flight suit, magic gloves, and everything is communicated to you in three dimensions. To your eyes, to your ears, to your hands. And you're tracking what this person is doing and with speech input. So you have the binaural sound system, speech input, all of this. This is all embedded and contained in this cockpit that you wear. And uh, this was basically the program that I put together and was running for the Air Force um, uh, for a number of years. And um, so the idea of this special cockpit here, and oh, by the way, you see what this guy's doing. He's reaching out to control a function. That switch panel isn't there. As soon as he moves his hand into a particular volume, the switch panel appears. You reach out and touch it, because you're tracking hand position. Reach out and touch it. You have as a vibrotactile array inside your gloves. You feel that it's been touched. You hear it click in three sound, and uh, that function is activated. You take your hand away and it disappears. Matter of fact, you want to get it out of the way. So. Um, the idea then of what the pilot would see is um, something that uh, transforms uh, this into this. This is now a mimetic display. This is what the pilot would see flying at night at a low altitude and high speed. It's a fusion of information from all of those instruments into a picture. And this picture contains just about everything. I mean, there's a, I haven't shown you this before, have I? No. Uh, that has the plan form of the aircraft, the weapon stores, it has uh, various uh, uh, indicators that you have in the cockpit. And then here's the world. Here's the terrain, v digital terrain over the real terrain. This is a one-to-one -one mapping of the real terrain. Remember, you're flying at night. And here are navigation waypoints that you see here. There are target wave points. Here are these barber poles you see here are parallax generators. Um, you can determine how, how high and how fast you're flying without having to look at any instrument by the flow field that's going by. Uh, here are the surface air missile batteries that are not radiating. You know them from your intelligence information. Here's one that is radiating. You know that from one of the sensors on the aircraft. The whole idea is do not fly through the red dome. It looks a little better. It does, but it's not very good for your health if you fly through the red dome. Your probability of survival is very low. Okay, so that's why the automatically generated uh, pathway in the sky avoids that, and the terrain obstacles. You're flying at low altitude, high speed, and so forth. Here is the real horizon, uh, the, the virtual horizon where the real horizon is, and uh, and the heading information up here. Here are two friendly aircraft, and here's a possible enemy aircraft. You don't know who this guy is. Because uh, you send him a signal, squawk, mode for IFF, identification for info. And uh, that's usually a classified thing that you send out, a signal you send out and saying, who are you? And they're supposed to say, oh, I'm Tom, you know, or I'm George. And uh, that's uh, encrypted and comes back and we say, okay, it's all right. 
But what if we don't get an answer? Well, if we were an Israeli fighter pilot, we'd shoot him. And uh, no questions asked. We're friends of Israel. What's that? We're friends of Israel. That, I, I know. Well, don't be flying in their space without your IFF turned on <laughs> because uh, you're dead meat. But the U.S., we can't do that. We said, ooh, gosh, this is bad. I got to use some other means to find out who this is. So you go to a television telescope, and you can go to all kinds of other things to try to identify this guy before you shoot at him. Um, so this is a fusion of all that information that you saw before. Um, now, the question is, let's see how well we did in terms of communicating all of this spatial and state information. Okay, where was the hillside located? Okay, where were those two friendly aircraft located? Okay, where was that um, surface air missile battery? The one was radiating. <laughs> and which side did you fly of that? Uh, oh, pretty good, guys. So do you think you can do the same thing with that? With lots of trim. <laughs> That's right. A good pilot basically creates the picture that you saw from this. But it's a transformation that has to take place. This is highly coded. And the whole idea was to build a display that's mimetic, that mimes the world, that acts like the world. Even though it's sort of a cartoonish, simplified view, it, it fills in the gaps of the information the pilot needs. Now, in, in daylight, you'd see through that. You'd see the real world uh, with that information superimposed like augmented reality. In the case of night, it's virtual reality. It pretty much takes the place of the world. But there's more to it than that. There are really two views. There's sort of this exocentric view and an egocentric view. The egocentric view is where you're the center and you're looking out, like a projection into a sphere. And that's what you saw in this mimetic display. But you want also to have an egocentric, uh, I mean an exocentric display. This is where you're outside of the world looking at yourself. And in, in this case, what you do is you project, again, through your uh, headgear your virtual display, this sort of fish bowl that's in your lap. And it contains a view of the world, of the whole world. And, uh, and you interact with those things in there. For example, in controlling the radios, you actually point to the, the object to talk to it. Or you ask the question, where is that? You put your finger on this object. And a l virtual laser line comes out of your finger and goes into the outside world and you see where that is. Or you look at the outside world and say, where is that? And it comes into your God's eye display. You see where it is. We've never been able to do that before. Communicate the spatial transformation inside and outside the cockpit. Okay, so this is all great theory, right? This whole super cockpit notion. Well, we had to prove that it would work. So we had to build our Darth Vader simulator. And this was a ground-based system that would uh, basically test these concepts to see that they would work on the ground before we went up to um, actually test them. And so this particular display is a 120-degree field of view. It's huge. It's like bigger than an IMAX theater. Stereographic, complete stereo. It all moves around when you move your head around. You have speech input, eye control, all this kind of stuff. Okay. Um, and it weighs a lot. And as a matter of fact, there's the negator spring assembly that sort of supports this thing, the weight of this thing. It's just a simulator, remember. So uh, here uh, is a little video about that. What is this? I'm going to tell you in a minute. This is what the pilot sees. Like some fantastic arcade game of the future, the pilot flies through a world that the computer has devised for him, based upon the known characteristics of the F-15 and its potential adversaries. In this Tron-like 3D arena, he can take off and land, and navigate to preset coordinates, and he can fire his guns if need be. There is still a gun. And activate his missiles 
all by voice control. Select. Collected. The engineers readily admit that these futuristic concepts are likely to remain impractical for at least the next eight to ten years. And clearly, no pilot could be persuaded to dogfight pulling G's with a ridiculous contraption like this on his head. But it is only experimental. And advances in miniaturizing the high-resolution TV screens that will project the graphic displays onto the inside of the visor have already led to the development of a new and much more feasible flying helmet currently under test. But even more unusual ideas are being developed at Wright-Patterson. This man is switching switches simply by looking at them. Using infrared lasers, sensors in his helmet read his eye position from moment to moment so that computers can identify the switch he's looking at. And down the corridor, the tiny magnetic fields given off by the brain activity of this research volunteer are being analyzed by a superconducting device known simply as squid. Controlling fighter aircraft systems simply by thinking is, some researchers claim, no more than 30 years away. Okay, so when do you think this tape was made? About 85. 85. Were you in that? Sorry? Were you in that tape? This was my project. But were you in it? Well, was I in this thing? Yeah. I was not in this video. I, I was in the, the, the program, Top Gun and Beyond. They interviewed me and everything. The person looking at the, um, the switches looked a lot like your youngest pictures. Oh, I see. <laughs> No, that wasn't me. <laughs> that was one of our uh, one of the guys working for me. Anyhow, this was done in '85, um, and of course I left the Air Force uh, in '89 um, uh, to start the Hit Lab. But my friends, who were working on this program after I left, um, invited me back a few years later, and they said. Uh, we want you to come back and see what we've done uh, since you've been gone. And so uh, I went back and they took me um, into this new simulator they built. This huge dome. I think there were 22 projectors <laughs> in this dome. And, uh, and it had a uh, hydraulic lift in this co cockpit. There's this cockpit uh, there in this, um, and this. Um, and so they, they strapped me in this cockpit and they put this uh, band around my head. Went around my head and then the helmet on. And then uh, raised me up into this dome, you know, to where everything was being projected, you know. So you look like you're in the air or whatever or on the ground taking off. And they said, okay, we want to uh, enroll you in the system. So we want, uh, we're going to tell you some things to think. And we want you to think those things, and then, uh, um, and then you can fly the airplane. So I did. So I spent about five minutes in rolling. They said, "Okay, you're ready to fly, but don't use your hands. Just think about where you want to go." And I did, and we're flying the airplane just by thinking about it. And um, now that probably ain't going to get into a real airplane for a while, but <laughs> still, it was it was working. So um, we beat it. We actually beat the time that was in this program. But you're not going to see that. Uh, now some of this technology is actually being uh, used today in, in some pieces of it in some, some aircraft. But uh, it usually we were usually about 20 years ahead of what finally gets into the, the real airplanes uh, with the R&D I was doing. But what this does is introduce the whole area of virtual reality as a human interface. Probably the most powerful human interface you can have, um, aside from direct neural interface, you know, going into the brain directly. Because we're going in almost to the brain. When you think about the retina of the eye is an optical coupler. Uh, the ears are an acoustic coupler. And, uh, you know, it, well, you have to do an awful lot actually get higher bandwidth to the brain by going to direct neural implants. You just don't have enough electrodes to do it. But we already have those built in. And that's what we're trying to occupy with the, um, 
uh, with this early technology in virtual reality. So what is virtual reality? Um, generally, um, I've, I've defined what I meant by virtual images, but um, let's look again at this situation where the idea with normal interfaces where we're on the outside looking in. We're trying to get the green blob into the gray blob, right? And we've, uh, as we've discussed before, you know, there are, the bandwidth of that transfer is going to be a function of the human side factors, especially what our eyes can take in, ears and, and hands and so forth, and what we can process in the brain, as well as the ability of the tool to actually convey content. So this is the old way. Now, it's interesting that uh, what you have to have in the brain is really sort of um, not only the blob, the green blob, which is the content, you have to take it in, you have to understand it, you have to process it. You know, there are cognitive functions associated with that. But you also need to know how to use, you have to have a model of the delivery mechanism. You have to know how to use it. Okay, here I have the screen, that conveys the content, but I have to know how to work all of this, right? Um, in order to get that transfer mechanism to get the blob delivered to me. Not only that, you know, I'm in an environment. I'm in this room. This room is uh, another space. So I'm physically in this room. I have this display, which is content. Now, uh, if I, uh, uh, in my head, I've developed actually a model of this space, haven't I? You know, I could blindfold each of you guys here and say, okay, make your way out of this building. And you could do it. You know generally where the door is, and you know where the, how the hallway goes around the front door and things like that. You can get out of here. So basically you have in your head a model of the space, physical space you're in, a model of the content that's being delivered here and how to operate the mechanism. Same would be true if you're sitting in your living room watching the Crusaders play a, you know, a, a rugby match. You have uh, your TV, you know how to operate your TV, you have to operate that. You know a little bit about the rules of rugby, perhaps. And then um, you know where the kitchen is, you know where the living room is, or where the bathroom is, or where the front door is. So you have this model in your head. So you have all these things going on in your head. So your TV is within your physical space. Now, when we're talking about VR, remember that what VR does is actually pulls you away from the real world somewhat, and now you're closing the loop with this simulated model, this technology intervention. We know that uh, you know we can do that with some technology. Generally, virtual interfaces have two things. There's uh, this information that's transmitted to the senses, right? The transduction to the senses, photons, mechanical vibrations, all this kind of thing. And then the other side is measuring some kind of motor behavior or something. Uh, it can be movement of your hands, eyes, it can be speech, it can be uh, chemicals that you emit, electrophysiological signals, things like that. So these are all packaged together into some kind of kit that generally, not always, that you, that you wear. And so this is now the technology that's the delivery mechanism. But then what is delivered? Well, it's sort of a world. It's a three-dimensional environment. It's a world. And this world becomes a replacement for that physical world you're normally operating in. Okay, well now let's look at what this does. What does virtual reality, what does interacting in virtual space do? So remember the old way, where you had um, all these models in your head in order to interact with this, this content. Now look at what happens with VR. So immersive VR um, basically puts you inside the content. 
So now instead of the content being inside your head, you're inside the content. This is a big transformation. There are a lot of implications of this. What happens to the physical environment you're in then? What happens to it? It stays where it is. You're just not conscious of it. Sorry? You're just not conscious of it. It disappears. It's taken from your experience, from your view. Well then, what are you conscious of? It becomes your new space. And so you're carrying all the three-dimensional models that you'd normally have in the real world into this three-dimensional virtual world. If you do it right, then a lot of things happen. First thing that happens is the delivery mechanism disappears. If you do it right, you don't even know it. You don't even know that you're wearing something. You make it lightweight enough, the Oculus Rift coming along, things like that. You know, you make it... Uh, uh, all the tracking, things like that. And then what happens is there's a fusion of that um, world, of this new world, the virtual world, in your brain. It's not like it's just a blob. It's like it's pervasive, just like you have in, when you're interacting with the real world. Let me tell you, that's transformative in terms of the bandwidth that you now take into a virtual world versus the bandwidth you have in interacting with this is enormous in terms of your ability to be able to use these natural functions to make it happen. Um, and to, just a question. If you are in this like this, so you're not conscious of the outside world and someone comes into your personal space in the real world, do you notice it? You can, but it's creepy. It's, uh, as a matter of fact, it's, re it's really spooky to talk to someone who's in the real world while you're in this virtual world because you don't see them there. You don't see them in your virtual world, and yet this voice is appearing from somewhere. But also, the person doing the demo is talking to the icon, giving them instructions of what to do. Mm -hmm. And people wearing a headset are just really confused because they, they want to look around and see the person. Mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. Yes, yes. And it turns out you can use that. <laughs> but it, it is a, when we, our very early days of VR, I mean, my lab, but uh, the HIT lab in the U.S. was doing the, the first of all of this ever, okay? And, um, and we had this uh, aquarium, this virtual aquarium you'd go in, and there were these really blocky looking fish swimming around. And the, the whole idea was to capture these fish in this net. And you'd be seeing all these people running around <laughs> trying to catch these fish in the net. And we were timing how fast you could catch all the fish in this little aquarium sort of a little game. But the amazing thing is when you took the helmet off. Now all of a sudden here you're in the same space, physical space, but you were in this aquarium. And now you pop the head off and now you're not in an aquarium. You're in, uh, you know, back in the, the lab space again. And it really, you really begin to realize the power that this, having this super wide field of view display and interactive, interactivity pulls you into this whole new world. Now one of the things that um, I didn't mention yet is that Darth Vader display, remember? Okay, so when we started playing with it, this was really the world's first interactive VR. And of course it was something way beyond what came along even later because of the field of view and the resolution and this kind of thing. Uh, you saw line graphics, you saw vector graphics being displayed on there, but we had also other computer graphics stuff. So when we first switched this on, we knew it was gonna be a fairly compelling thing, you know, this wide field of view thing. We had no idea though, uh, when it's with the interactivity, what it would do. And so um, it was, it, it just sort of 
just pulled you into it. And so we started looking at uh, experiments to find out, well, what's going on here in terms of this compelling pull-in? And so, um, so we electronically masked the instantaneous field of view of the display down to 20 degrees. So you just see it had a 20 degree picture, then all the way up to 120 degrees. And uh, we looked at how it mapped into the brain and the, how you stored information and things like that. And as long as you were less than around 60 degrees, you thought of yourself as sitting in a cockpit with this helmet on that is moving this picture around. But as soon as it went beyond that, when it gets to 60 to 80 degrees, something happened. It's like a switch went off in your head. And like somebody reached out of the picture and pulled you inside, and now you're not sitting in a cockpit anymore. You're in a place. You're in it. You're in the world. It's like your brain is trying to decide, where am I? And it's a function of this, this field of view and the interactivity of that field of view. So we had that already in our mind. It's 60 to 80 degrees is where you need to be. How much does Oculus Rift have? Ten. Yeah. See, all time before this, it was always, uh, the field of view was a lot smaller. And um, so since that time, this has proven itself over and over again. There's something magic happens. Uh, all these smaller field of view helmet displays that you're seeing the 30 degrees and 40 degrees, they really don't cut it. I mean, you can get a virtual picture, take a place of the screen but it's just a virtual screen now. It's not a place. That's not really what, what I consider virtual reality. Okay, so Milgram comes along. You guys have heard of Milgram. Mark talks about Milgram a lot. And uh, uh, Milgram came up with this continuum. You've seen this chart before, right? Yeah. Well, the whole idea is, you know, that's not just virtual reality and reality. You know, you got these it's sort of a, uh, this whole mixed reality in between. Because what you can do is take virtual objects and augment the real world. Or you can take real objects and aug augment the, the virtual world. So you have now this continuum. Some examples of that. Uh, reality, of course, is where you're interacting with matter directly yourself. Um, and... Um, Augmented reality is where you're also looking at the real world, but you can augment it. For example, looking at the night sky and seeing the constellations projected over there. Um, and so you get to see the combination of the two, and that adds information to what you might have. And of course, with your city view that, that has been done here in the hit lab, you're able to augment Christchurch with the original buildings and things like that. If you look at augmented virtuality, here you now, you're in a virtual world, all this virtual world here, but you now inset, it in, 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 inset into that a uh, real world kinds of things. Let's say, for example, we, we sort of do that all the time with, with uh, weathermen, <laughs> in a way. You know, they're, they're in front of this green screen, right? And, uh, and so they're the real thing, but the, the, the weather map is really sort of the virtual thing. And so you see this weatherman in this virtual world. That's sort of a in a way, an augmented virtuality. And of course, you have then. It would be like a good example of. Sorry? So, movies these days would be a good example of augmented virtuality, considering how often they're just done with CGI. Well. Someone in front of a green screen. Yes, that's right. That's right. I mean, The Lord of the Rings, all this stuff is. is uh, as a matter of fact, we, the lab here, probably, uh, you, you don't know this, but we did, uh, we had a traveling exhibit that we did for Lord of the Rings. We're actually working with Dell uh, workshops to. Uh, build a green screen version so you can go into a museum and you could actually become uh, one of the uh, swords and things like that. And uh, that was a little project was done. And then of course, virtuality is where that's all your, that's all it is. It's completely virtual. People are virtual, all the other, other uh, impacts and things like that. So here's another example of virtuality. This is all called all sphere. Uh, amazing, actually. TED Talk. Okay. The 
allosphere. It's a three-story metal sphere in an echo-free chamber. Think of the allosphere as a large, dynamically varying digital microscope. It's connected to a supercomputer. 20 researchers can stand on a bridge suspended inside of the sphere and be completely immersed in their data. Imagine if a team of physicists could stand inside of an atom and watch and hear electrons spin. Imagine if a group of sculptors could be inside of a lattice of atoms and sculpt with their material. Imagine if a team of surgeons could fly into the brain as though it was a world and see tissues as landscapes and hear blood density levels as music. This is some of the research that you're going to see that we're undertaking at the Alice here. But first, a little bit about this group of artists, scientists, and engineers that are working together. I'm a composer, orchestrally trained, and the inventor of the allosphere. With my visual artist colleagues, we map complex mathematical algorithms that unfold in time and space, visually and sonically. Our scientist colleagues are finding new patterns in the information, and our engineering colleagues are making one of the largest uh, dynamically varying computers in the world for this kind of data exploration. I'm going to fly you into five research projects in the allosphere that are going to take you from biological macroscopic data all the way down to electron spin. This first project is called the Allobrain, and it's our attempt to quantify beauty by finding which regions of the brain are interactive while witnessing something beautiful. You're flying through the cortex of my colleague's brain. Our narrative here is real fMRI data that's act visually and sonically the brain now a world that we can fly through and interact with. You see 12 intelligent computer agents, the little rectangles that are flying in the brain with you. They're mining blood density levels, and they're reporting them back to you sonically. Higher density levels mean more activity in that point of the brain. They're actually seeing these densities to you with higher pitches mapped to higher densities. We're now going to move from real biological data to biogenerative algorithms that create artificial nature in our next artistic and scientific installation. In this artistic and scientific installation, biogenerative algorithms are helping us to understand self-generation and growth, very important for simulation in the nanoscale sciences. For artists, we're making new worlds that we can uncover and explore. These generative algorithms grow over time, and they interact and communicate our researchers are interacting with this data by injecting bacterial code into computer programs that allow these creatures to grow over time. We're going to move now from the biological and the macroscopic world down into the atomic world. We fly into a lattice of atoms. This is real AFM atomic force microscope data from my colleagues in the Solid State Lighting and Energy Center. They discovered a new bond, a new material for transparent solar through 2,000 lattice of atoms, oxygen, hydrogen, and zinc. You view the bond as a triangle. It's four blue zinc atoms bonding with one white hydrogen atom. You see the electron flow with the streamlines we as artists have generated from the scientists. This is allowing them to find the bonding nodes in any lattice of atoms. We think it makes a beautiful structure of art. The sound that you're hearing, the actual emission spectrums of these atoms, mapped them into the audio domain, so they're singing to you. Oxygen, hydrogen, and zinc have their own signature. We're going to actually move even further down as we go from this lattice of atoms to one single hydrogen atom. We're working with our physicist colleagues that have given us the mathematical calculations of the n-dimensional Schrodinger equation in time. What you're seeing here right now is a superposition of an electron in the lower three orbitals of a hydrogen atom actually hearing and seeing the electron flow with the lines. The white dots are the probability wave that will show you where the electron is at any given point of time and space in this particular three orbital configuration. In a minute, we're going to move to a two orbital configuration, and you're going to notice a pulsing, and you're going to hear an undulation between the sound. This is actually a light emitter. As the sound starts to pulse and contract, our physicists can tell when a photon is going to be emitted. They're starting to find new mathematical structures in these calculations, and they're understanding more about quantum mathematics. We're going to move even further down and go to one single electron spin. 
and this will be the final project that I show you. Our colleagues in the Center for Quantum Computation and Spintronics are actually measuring with their lasers decoherence in a single electron spin. We've taken this information and we've made a mathematical model out of it. You're actually seeing and hearing quantum information flow. This is very important for the next step in simulating quantum computers and information technology. So these brief examples that I've shown you give you an idea of the kind of work that we're doing at the University of California, Santa Barbara to bring together arts, science, and engineering into a new age of math, science, and art. We hope that all of you will come to see the Alice Sphere, inspire us to think of new ways that we can use this unique instrument uh, that we've created at Santa Barbara. Thank you very much. Pretty amazing. I immediately thought of the Cerberus from X Men. Sorry? I mean, this little Cerberus from X Men did a big thing um, Professor X goes into to find mutants. Mm. <laughs> yeah, well, so this is sort of a cave on steroids, you know. It's uh, um, not everyone's going to have one of these things in their uh, living room. But it um, be a very big living room. Um, um, it is an example of virtuality. So this is sort of what I've learned over the years. Um, and I've, I've spent more time in virtual reality than anybody else in the world. Because, you know, pretty much I was there at the beginning of it. Uh, the very first virtual reality experience is pretty much, I did it. And uh, uh, there's another guy of mine named Ivan Sutherland who was sort of working on about the same time I was. Uh, but he was working in parallel with me. He quit and just started doing some other things and I kept doing it. So my whole career, pretty much professional career, has been working on virtual reality. Um, but it's clear what I, what I, what's come out of this. It's amazing what you can do with a good interface in terms of empowering people. Um, that uh, the face is the only, the interface is the only face that you see. And uh, that is uh, uh, what will make the difference in terms of our ability to tap the technology that's behind the screen. We found that virtual reality really works. It has to be done right, though. The kind of terms that are used for virtual reality these days is not virtual reality in terms of, of the immersive, truly the immersive system and having the power that we, we have with it. Um, you get this amazingly increased uh, bandwidth of the brain and the fact that you can behave um, intuitively when you're, uh, we have a problem? No. Um, we, we, where you can now take all the skills and intuition that you have, the way that you interact in a three-dimensional world into the virtual world and use that effectively. Um, we, have, we do know that it requires a wide field of view to immerse. Not just the field of view, but the making it interactive is, is important. Uh, when you get inside the virtual worlds, um, you can accelerate your ability to learn because, because you never forget it. Because when you go into a true virtual world, you never forget it. Um, it's like the difference between watching uh, a program on television about Disney World versus going to Disney World. You never forget going to Disney World. Um, that kind of thing. Right. Good question. I think that uh, uh, first of all, we it's very difficult to compare augmented reality and virtual reality because they're really two different things altogether. I think uh, they are they will have different application domains. Um, the reason that, all, that virtual reality didn't succeed is uh, twofold. 
the technology was crap in terms of the quality of the experience that you'd have in terms of the fields of view and the resolution and displays and things like that. Unless you're going to spend millions of dollars like I was, you know, and uh, with uh, those uh, miniature cathode ray tubes, you know, we're scanning 1,200 TV lines with water-cooled electronics. We had to cool them with water. I mean, we were spinning the beam around so fast. Now, of course, we have other technology to take place, OLEDs and virtual retinal displays and things like that. So the technology for delivery was not very good. And then, of course, uh, the content of the, the way that you generate the content, the tools for generating the content, and in particular, the rendering engines didn't run fast enough. All you could do is render, you know, a million, a few million polygons a second, uh, and uh, and that would cost you five hundred thousand dollars. Whereas now, an NVIDIA card that costs one hundred and twenty-five bucks can do ninety million polygons or more uh, a second, and so that there was a combination of those things. But still, in the end, what it's going to be about is the content. Content is king. That uh, what are the world? What's the world you're going to go to? And I'm going to show you something later on about about how do you build those worlds and so forth. Okay. So there's some real advantages of virtual space. It really lets us do this intuitive kind of interface, exploring the third dimension and using this natural way to interact. It lets us build these mental models that we never forget, and it lets us now augment real space if we want to, like this virtuality that thing that I mentioned to you before. Another thing is it's natural appealing, and as I mentioned before, you don't forget it. But there are some disadvantage of it. Uh, unless you're building an all sphere, where you have this big, huge dome, projection dome, you have to use that to wear something. People don't like wearing things necessarily that uh, would give them uh, these these field view. We'll see what happens with the uh, when the functionality comes out with the Oculus Rift. There are performance limitations, particularly the the the, the tech, older technology. There's this limited picture size, the field of view, the instantaneous field of view, how many pixels you can put across there compared to what the eye needs. Um, how fast can you update that and refresh it? Because if you now look at what can that happen with the eyes, you, you're talking a minimum of 3,000 by 4,000 picture elements going into each eye and refreshing that it's 60 times above, or 60 times a second or more. And if you're trying to do head tracking uh, and zero latency um, prediction, all those kinds of things, let me tell you the pixel flow rate is huge. And just to get the bandwidth, the sheer bandwidth to push those pixels into the display devices becomes difficult. Furthermore, it is really difficult to get true binocular vision, a true binocular display. Um, uh, although we can do it and have done it. One of the projects in my uh, lab in Seattle was to build a true 3D display. Now the problem is with all of the 3D, including the Oculus Rift, is the image plane is going to be at the same distance, regardless of where you wanted it to appear. Because all of the light coming in is infinity collimated. The light wavefront is if all the pixels are at optical infinity, and yet you're creating a binocular pair, a vergence cue of an object that's not in optical infinity. It's up closer to you. But the light rays are still coming in as if it were at optical infinity. So there's a disconnect between the accommodative cues of the eye and the, um, and the binocular cues of the eye, the vergence cues. So you have, this, uh, you have a, a difference between the binocular depth sensing and the binocular depth sensing. And that's true of all these devices that are out there. It's true in the vision space. Vision space is the same problem. Even though you have 3D, you know, especially when you're bringing things out of the screen, still those pixels are coming from the screen, the distance of the screen, and not this close. Because if you did it right and you're looking at the far field, the near field would be out of focus. You look at the far field um, and, and focusing on that. And vice versa, if you're focusing on the near field, the far field would be out of focus. And uh, all of this and parallax and all these kinds of things become real factors there. So cr creating true binocular vision is difficult. 
not only because of this accommodating problem, but because of you got to get it right or you give people headaches and they'll be fatiguing, very fatiguing. Then there's the cyber sickness. Cyber sickness can be a showstopper. Cyber sickness is where you have a conflict between the visual and vestibular cues. Let's say that uh, your visual cues are telling you that uh, you're rolling the airplane. Let's say that you're rolling the airplane like that. But your vestibular cues and your inner ear are saying, no, you're not. You're still just sitting level. Okay, that conflict between the visual cues and vestibular cues makes you barf, makes you sick. It's motion sickness, simulator sickness. And um, unless you do it right, uh, we have ways to do that, to do it right. We figured out ways to get around this problem. Um, then you have a real problem because you don't want people getting sick using your thing. We had, we had a driving simulator, had a car in, actually a full-size car, and these screens all around it. And we called it our barf mobile. Because what would happen is that there's a great scene that you could see in it and driving along and things like that. But when you stop, you know, yes, the scene, the scene stops, but you don't get the sensation in your otoliths and the inner ear that you're stopping, you're slowing down. Oh my goodness. That, that really does throw you for a spin. And you come out of that thing sort of shaky, that simulator. So driving simulators are very difficult to do. Much easier to do aircraft simulators where you have a, your flow field is a lot different than what you have in driving. Uh, you say you have this kind of no, it doesn't. Now, even motion, putting motion in the, in the simulator doesn't help when you have a wide field of view display. How do we solve it? We, we had what we call an independent background that actually was embedded in the scene which was, and we can modulate between the, the virtual world and this embedded background. And the embedded background, there was no conflict with the vestibular cues. So we mixed it, basically. We mixed some things into the real scene, into the virtual scene that was rolling with something that was stable. And this helped a lot. Uh, solving. As a matter of fact, we came up with an invention. We have a patent out there now for uh, a seasickness. So that uh, when you have at a high sea state, the water is going all over the place. You don't see the horizon anymore. Best thing you can do when you get seasick is go out outside, outside and look at the horizon, so that you don't have a conflict between what you see and what you're feeling with your inner ear. Um, but when you're in high sea state, you can't see the horizon. And or you're inside the boat. If you're inside the boat, the boat is moving, but your real world isn't. You find yourself sort of doing this <laughs> make you sick. But you put on your glasses, anti seasickness glasses, and what that does is give you the real horizon, which corresponds to what your vestibular cues are telling you are going on. And you can be inside the boat and not get sick. We have a patent on that. Okay, so, um, so it's not all peaches and cream because we're really messing around with deeply coupling uh, this technology into the human senses. And uh, we've got to do that right or we can cause real problems. And this is especially true when you have artifacts built in your display like latency problems. You move your head and the display catches up and things like that. Because what happens is you adapt to that. And you store these coefficients in your head that let you ad adapt to that so you can make it work. But then when you take it off, you know, you have this problem. You have two sets of coefficients stored in your head. You have one set for the real world and one set for the virtual world. And the question is, does your brain know which one to use at what time? And so you'll be driving your car along and you move your head and you, the world doesn't do right because you've been in the virtual world. So you can really screw up somebody big time. Uh, you know. It can, it can, it can. And uh, usually we, uh, even in, in flight training simulators for training fighter pilots and commercial airline pilots, 
you will not let them fly the real airplane uh, unless it's three days after they've been in the simulator because of these issues. This disconnect between the visual and the stimulator cues. Yeah. Can you do that at an inverse level? So say you're moving your head um, to get like so say in your virtual world instead of if you started playing things at a slower rate and the person's movement would be slower all that kind of thing and they'd start to compensate for that but they start to they'll start to react slower and move slower can you do that in an inverse way that you increase the speed of their world um, well like, like with the head move they do it at an inverse so they've got to move their head more to do a smaller amount and increase their reflexes that way well we actually did that um, uh, not as much to do the reflexes, but to give them, a, for example, one of the things that we had in this, I didn't show you in the fighter cockpit, is a, call we, is a, 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 a actually a television telescope called TISIO, Target Identification System Electro-Optical. This thing is sitting in the, the wing, actually, in the leading wing of the airplane. This television telescope is gyro-stabilized. And so what you would do is you'd see the target, you see the visible target out there, and you not know what it is. You, you pop that tissue over to it with your line of sight. Then your display comes up and you see this magnified view. Well, the problem is if you're talking about now taking a two degree field of view or one degree field of view and your uh, display is, you're displaying it at 30 degrees, you have a 30 times magnification, let's say. So any movement of the head is moving this thing out all over the place. So we said, well, how can we stabilize that? Can, or do we want to decouple it from the head? No, we don't want to do that because we're using head sort of steer this thing. Uh, so we decided to work on what we call an origin transfer mode. The origin transfer mode is where we decouple the position by the same amount we're magnifying the image. So what would happen is, let's say with this 30 times magnification, what we would do is decouple this so where you move your head three degrees, the sensor would only move one-tenth of a degree. So the illusion you got was you're translated toward the target 30 times, looking at it with one-to-one -one magnification, which was a much more natural way to interact with it and things like that. So that, that was one way that we solved some of the, uh, the magnification problems in that. But uh, in terms of a training thing to muck around with, these, with the coupling, not a good idea. <laughs> uh, because... Um, you humans are really plastic. You know, we can adapt to these things. But in the process of adapting, we have this uh, the scratch pad memory sitting there, you know, with these con with coefficients in there that we have to be careful about. One of the things always was a problem in spending a lot of time in virtual worlds is um, when you are in the real world, you, you have to go through doors. Uh, whereas virtual worlds, you can be sort of sloppy at that. You know, you can walk through this, but you can pass through the door sill and things like that, you know. Yeah, but I found myself often bumping into the, to the door sill because I was, you know, I was not thinking about it. And uh, so uh, we're going to see all kinds of interesting maladies emerge as virtual reality really does get adopted. But I believe that the, uh, the advantages way outweigh the disadvantages. We can solve the disadvantage because it's amazing what happens when you're in there and what you can learn and remember. And uh, especially for kids learning things. It's, uh, Yes, it could be. One of the areas that has to, there has to be a lot of work. I mean, you, uh, well, I'll tell you this story. I'll tell you this story next time because of, uh, with my, when we were, we commercialized a system that was out there and some of the things we learned from that. But anyhow, um, it, it, it is important for us to look at the whole thing, not just that we can get this virtual picture, but what does it do? What does it mean in terms of these 
these disadvantage, these disadvantage sides of things. Okay, let's look at some uh, applications. I'm about out of time here, but uh, let's just look at a couple, uh, one application here, and then we'll continue on with some of the applications later on, uh, well, next week. So this business about virtual healing. Uh, we've done so many things in medicine. That's probably our predominant activity in, in uh, Seattle. Uh, the Seattle activity has been much more hardware oriented than the, uh, than the activity here. This is mainly software oriented here. But um, we've done a, built a lot of, we have seven or eight surgical simulators that are out there now. Uh, several of them we've licensed for um, training surgeons how to do various procedures. Uh, we've uh, looked at operating room uh, informatics. We've created virtual operating rooms. How do you display information around them? All this done in an immersive virtual world. Um, how do you visualize information in those worlds? And then therapy delivery to the body and to the mind. Um, let me show you um, uh, some mind stuff. So um, you remember uh, I mentioned this personal eyewear display that I'd, I'd worked on. This is one of my patents. And uh, here's a person wearing that so you can sit on the beach and watch the TV at the same time or a movie or whatever you want to do. But I also mentioned that uh, we found this in interesting uh, application of the technology, right? That uh, dentists started buying these things like crazy uh, in order to entertain the patients while they're inflicting pain on them. And, uh, and that it was amazing what happened. The, the patients didn't complain anymore. Um, little kids couldn't wait to go to the dentist um, so they could play that game, this Nintendo. So, mm -hmm. yeah, isn't that amazing? Yeah. So, um, so this became, uh, you know, this is what we started studying and got us into this VR and pain thing. But, but, but before I get to that, let me mention one other thing. It happened. While we were, there were some television programs about the stuff we were doing with this uh, personal eyewear display. And this doctor uh, contacts us and he says, you know, he says, I have Parkinson's disease. And uh, Parkinson's disease is a, a motor problem, you know, a, a motor cognitive problem. Yeah, and you, people get the shakes and things like that. And, and one of the problems with Parkinson's disease is what is called kinesia paradoxa, uh, which means that. Um, uh, it, generally, you have a problem initiating ambulation. If you have a you have a homogeneous floor like this, you know that's, and if you want to try to walk, you can't do it. You, you're just trying to walk and you can't do it. Um, whereas if you put some objects on the floor, like like playing cards, you space them out, or anything, a quarter, something like that. No problem. They can walk right over them. Now, nobody knows why this happens. Um, but uh, there's, this, this, this is this kinesia paradoxa. And um, so by putting these objects or lines in the past, subject's past, they can, they can walk. And so um, we did, this doctor says, you know, that's a real problem, though. Go, everywhere we go, well, you have to put structure in the past so I, I can walk. Because I don't want, you can take medicine for this, L-DOPA. But L-DOPA is nasty stuff. I mean, it's, uh, it only works for a while, and, uh, it, and it's toxic and things like that. And, and so you dose yourself with L-DOPA, and you can do for a while, but then you get into this other state where you, you go into a, a state where you have uncontrollable, under, uncontrolled movement, where you, when you walk, you think this person is walking like this. And that's the other end of L-DOPA. So there's this sweet spot right in the middle where you're okay. So that's a problem. But he said, you know, if we could put structure in the visual environment, then uh, we wouldn't need the L-DOPA. And that's what we did. We took this uh, personal eyewear display, a virtual vision thing. Here he is, Tom Reese. And we basically projected virtual objects on the floor. 
that would move as you're moving. So we measure the movement, and then we'd make these things move in front of you, right? And, um, and it worked. And this guy now goes, goes on hikes and things like that with this. And, and when they're able to do this, the other, some of the other symptoms go away. They don't know why, the other shaking symptoms and things like that. And smiling, the ability to smile. Because generally the Parkinson's patients have difficulty smiling. So anyhow, that was something we discovered by accident, by somebody that just saw something and said, hmm, wonder if it would work for that. And this is what happens a lot, what has happened most of the time, actually, in the work that we've, we've done. I told you about the blind guy, all by accident, you know, just by those things happening. So all of this got us into the pain, VR and pain. And one of my colleagues uh, worked in the Hit Lab US, uh, um, Hunter Hoffman, um, started doing this research and uh, pain control in VR. And uh, as a result of what we began to see in, um, with these dentists. And so uh, we did a project with Children's Hospital, which is the hospital in Seattle, the regional hospital where the kids come in and are really sick, go through leukemia and you know, all kinds of other cancer, bad stuff, chemo, the chemo stuff. And so, the, the real, one of the challenges in that is um, you have to take bone marrow samples to see how the chemo is working. And just the process of taking a sample with a little patient is really painful. You usually have to put a needle, a big needle, into a hip and, and stick it down in there to draw out the marrow. And you can't anesthetize them because they're really sick. And uh, so usually they will scream, you know, it's so painful, just scream. But we'd take our kit, same thing you saw with the dental office, we'd take, uh, take that into the, to the, in with the physician, kid would put the headset on, me playing Nintendo, we'd be bent over, the doctor puts in the needle, and the kid goes, oh, keeps going. Unbelievable. The same kid that would be screaming, you know, playing the game. Well, the doctors were looking at this. I mean, we knew that television numbed the mind, but we didn't know how much, you know, it really does. Um, so we started doing more experiments. And there is a journal, a respected journal called Pain. And uh, we were the first, this is the first time ever in Pain journal that there was a photograph on the front cover. Uh, usually in the past, it was some kind of chemical thing, a molecular structure that. Here was our experiment, our first experiment we did with burn patients. Um, burn patients are a, a special case of pain. Um, and uh, this, this, there's a nurse that's doing some uh, therapy on a, on a patient, and the patient's inside a virtual world. So uh, what usually happens is that for burn patients, you control the pain with opiates, with morphine. And, uh, and you can generally do that when the patient is resting. In bed, they've been burned, they're resting. They aren't doing anything but resting. And um, so here you see um, the incidence is a pain all the way from no pain to excruciating. And this is the number of patients here in this particular survey that was done. Now, let's say now that the, so they've been resting in the bed, but then they have to go for treatment, either physical therapy, you know, or are removing staples from a skin graft, or you're soaking them in a tub of, of water and you're sloughing off the dead skin, pain shoots through the roof. Matter of fact, you can't even dose the patient with enough morphine. It's what we call breakthrough pain. Morphine doesn't do anything. And so, uh, again, it's excruciatingly painful. And um, you can imagine how they don't look forward to that treatment every day. Okay, so. We started doing this. We said, okay, let's see if this would work, this VR would work in this situation. So one of the, su the first subject we, we ran, we said, okay, let's, let's compare this with just playing a video game. Here you have Nintendo over here, and you have your controller here, and you have the a doctor or nurse working on the patient here. Okay, and the, you're looking at the, um, the red is, the, is using Nintendo a video game. Over here, you're in an immersive virtual world. 
uh, sort of clunky, but you're flying around in this world and you're basically in a world that is um, cool. It's uh, like Hunter's uh, um, snow world. And um, so, um, so we look at the data and here's what we find. These are pain ratings for these, in these categories. And this, remember the red is the Nintendo, the regular Nintendo. The blue is the VR. And this is the pain rating for the worst pain they've experienced, unpleasantness of pain, time spending thinking about pain, anxiety, and how they connected with the game, how they felt connected. This is amazing. And we thought, wow. And we thought, well, it'll work one time. You know, you will, we'll do this one time and that's it. It is, <laughs> you know, we're done. Not so. As a matter of fact, it gets better over time. It actually gets better. So here you have uh, uh, all kinds of patients who uh, uh, have, uh, when they're able to go into this virtual world, don't mind the therapy. Often what would happen, you see this, the smile on this therapist's face. She couldn't believe it, what was happening. Usually the patients are groaning and moaning, complaining and hurt, shouting or you know, screaming or whatever is going on here. But often what will happen, and, uh, and I've seen this happen, you know, the, the, uh, the, the therapist will be working on the patient, they're in this virtual world, things like that, and, and uh, the patient will say, well, uh, we, you say to the patient, well, give me your pain index. And they say, well, when are you going to start? When, in fact, you've already finished the, the therapy. In order to experience pain, you have to be conscious of it. And the way we multiplex with our, in our, with our, our cognition machine, um, like we talked about uh, before, the, uh, yeah. So here's a water VR. We had to build a special gadget to work with in water <laughs> because you don't want a guy wired with electricity. So this is all fiber optics, person in the tub. So a lot about this VR therapy. There's a, a hunter wrote an article for um, Scientific American. Here's a little video about one of the patients. We were cooking pasta and Nathan touched the pot and pulled it on himself. Six-year-old Nathan Meisinger has endured skin grafts, months of wound care, and more pain than safe doses of narcotics can kill. It can ease their pain, but their mind's still directed to they're going to go into the tank room, they're going to get scrubbed down. Then there's physical therapy to stretch his scarred skin. But through it all, Nathan's brain can go off to play in a 3D computer-generated world called Snow World. What we're really trying to do is just to pull his attention away from what's happening in the therapy, to put his attention in the virtual world, and, and by virtue of that, have him experience less pain. The University of Washington psychologists Hunter Hoffman and David Patterson created Snow World for treating burn victims. Their clinical studies with patients like Nathan are showing how effective virtual reality is at fighting the fire of burn pain. Patients who went into virtual reality reported having large reductions in how much pain they were experiencing, typically 40 to 50 percent reduction on average. In an article in Scientific American, Hoffman described how a special virtual reality helmet that would work in an MRI scanner confirmed this. The brain scan showed far fewer pain signals with virtual reality than without it. So I didn't feel anything really, but I did feel some pain, but not that much. Anything to get his mind off seeing the nurses with their, you know, equipment trying to work on him helped all a lot. The researchers hope virtual reality will soon be available to help many more patients escape their pain. I'm Warren Schoenfeld. So now this has become sort of a world standard kind of thing for, for treatment, especially battlefield wounds and, and that uh, could have been done be in the Oculus Rift in the hospitals and things soon. Yeah. Well, this whole business of how do you measure what's going on with these patients, it wasn't good enough to just get this subjective measure. We wanted to get the objective measure, so we had to come up with a way to do that. Working with uh, radiology people and the fMRI, uh, we came up with this, again, this device that you could put into an fMRI that would relay the virtual images so a patient could be looking at this. So what we did is we ran a number of subjects, again, graduate students. We had to come up with some good ways to inflict pain 
Oh, that was so fun. <laughs> what do you think is the best way to inflict pain? Uh, on like a for a <laughs> yeah, the, for uh, for a study like this. Uh, Stabbing the feet. Chinese hmm? <laughs> Chinese <laughs> Needles, huh? Well, as it turns out, uh, actually the best way to introduce pain um, when you aren't trying to kill the patient and you're not trying to torture them necessarily, but you're going to have a very uh, measured way of, of titrating. The best way to do it is by shocking a tooth pulp, put electric current oh. in the tooth, and you control the current and the, the tooth. Yeah. Shocking a tooth. And uh, you can now adjust that. But we couldn't use that in this case. Oh, they wouldn't let us use that. <laughs> but the, the, the second uh, best was probably a tourniquet. You know, and over a period of time, the pain goes up. But uh, the third best is put your hand in ice water. Yeah. And you leave it there, and it, the pain starts going up. But what we used on this is actually uh, heat pads on the feet. You start heating the, the soles of the feet, and the pain would go up with the temperature. We measured the temperature and all this kind of thing. And then, uh, you know, while they're looking at this virtual world, we got this, these differences. It's amazing how the brain lights up without VR here in the pain centers, but with VR, you don't see it there. But you see this little shift up here, frontal lobe. So you're paying attention to what's going on in the virtual world here. So a lot of uh, lessons learned from pain that, that does numb the mind, television. And there is a, I have one question. If this is would be something that they can do with mm -hmm. your brain, yeah. kind of like to... We have. As a matter of fact, we've been playing with this a lot, of, a, of other ways of measuring pain other than putting a person in a coil. Uh, actually, there is a good wincing response. This right here, these muscles right here around the eye are a very good measure uh, that correlate with other, other measures. That's just when you... When you get when you have pain, generally these muscles seem to be affected. Now, as if you're not drugged, if you if you have some kind of drugs you're taking, opiates, then that may not be the case. Now, this, uh, but uh, I mean that was one of the things we wanted to do with our ghost man, where we're we're actually using the ghost man to for physical therapy. We want to find out how far out you go before the pain starts, because you want to experience a little bit of pain, but not a whole lot because otherwise you won't get the person to do the exercise. So you start you measuring, you start measuring this wincing response when you get up here. Of course, if they know that, patients know that, they'll start wincing all the time. And okay, well, we can stop there, and we'll talk about next time some more applications in the future of interfaces, what's going to happen in the longer term. On next uh, Thursday at the same time. Okay? Same place. Any questions? Well, I mean, uh, generally the reason I'm telling you all these stories is because not only is this background, but this is happening now. These things are actually coming to fruition. And, uh, and and some of the background for them, but the pain is being the pain stuff is happening now. I'm just wondering what like what the art of life path is. Ah, okay. Uh, I guess that. You know, uh, yeah. Okay, I see what you're saying. Okay. Interesting. Well, that's 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 actually what I plan to talk about on the to uh, next time. Yeah. Week. <laughs> I found that. Um, I've learned a whole lot of stuff coming and listening to you because I didn't realize that a lot of the stuff had actually been even touched on. 
it's like still really new and exciting to me but then on here it's like oh no this is 10 20 years old <laughs> but you don't realize it unless you're in the area and you get told about it mm -hmm. in the area. Yeah. or unless you went to the mm -hmm. hospital and had the pain treatment mm -hmm. even here again this didn't happen this we didn't know this we just got to do it right <laughs> well it's um it um the whole um my whole journey again has been that's why I tell stories that I, and I try to digest what comes from the experiences into something that can be generalizable perhaps but I think the uh, um, you'll have your own stories it's it's but it's really the harvest of a quiet eye um, you take the journey but there's some things that will show up in the process of taking the journey that may be more interesting than the destination you'd planned, that may take you off in another place that is so fun to, uh, to, to follow. Yeah, but I do believe in my heart of hearts that uh, there is great power in this, this virtual reality stuff uh, in terms of, of coupling deeply what we can do with machines with what goes on in the brain. We don't have to go in with electrodes into the brain to do that. And, uh, but once we're there, we have to be careful what we do because we're sort of in a sacred territory. And we can uh, harm as, and hurt as well as help. And so we have to be aware of those things. And so it's responsible use of technology that, we're, that you know, is important. I mean, with our technological bag of tricks, we can do just about anything about it. I mean, almost, you know, you just, uh, and you ask a person today, at least in the Western world, do they have, a, do they have an app for that? And, uh, and they'll say, well, I don't know, but there will be. <laughs> it's just a matter of time. So we have this amazing faith in technology that there will be an app for that. Um, but with that power, we need to, um, we need to apply in a, in a responsible way socially responsible way and that's one of the things I'm going to talk about next next time too yeah I agree. I don't think it's universal, and, and it's going to be good for some things. And, and, and you don't want, I mean, let's, let's say that you, uh, one of the education worlds we, we built was a forest a, um, for this for kids, uh, a virtual forest. And in the virtual forest, one of the persons becomes a tree. You grow up, and you become a tree with your branches going out and your photosynthesis and things like that and all the nutrients you're growing from the ground. And, and another one of your friends becomes a squirrel that builds a nest in, or a bird that flies from tree to tree. And another one of your friends is an earthworm yeah, that helps the aerate man. the soil, you know, so that it comes in. What's that? The other one's the axe man. That's right. <laughs> yeah, that's I, I was going to get to that in a minute. And, and so uh, um, this doesn't, uh, yeah, and then and then the, the lumberjack comes and chops you down and turns you to a piece of toilet paper. But see, the thing is, we don't appreciate. A lot of people don't, you know, when they ask American kids, um, they show them different uh, vegetables, and they they didn't know what they were, you know, what they what a vegetable was that they they were eating, or they didn't know what um, the hamburgers came from, and. Um, so this does not take the the does not take the place of going into a real forest. But once you've been in a virtual forest, you have a greater appreciation for the real forest. And you may want to do augmented reality in a real forest. Now where you're interacting with the real world, but you can see now the, the nutrient, the process, the whole 
ecology of a forest in a way that brings the textbook to the place for an educational. And again, I believe that those are things that you don't forget and you appreciate more, you know, what, what's going on in the world. And the problem is that we've separated the two, the, the books, the classroom from the real world. The how, idea is how can you take these things into the real world, the classroom into the real world, and, um, and learn as you go with what's out there. So next time we'll be talking about some of the educational applications of VR, and especially how do we deal with our future? How do we awaken this kid who can't wait to get home to play Grand Theft Auto? You know. All right? Okay, guys. We'll see you next Thursday.